Welcome to part two of our mold and part making video series. We're going to go through the process of casting polyurethane into the silicone mold made in part one of this series. If you haven't watched that video, we highly suggest you view it to understand some of the details of making a well constructed silicone mold. In this video, we're going to discuss available casting materials, processing techniques, pigmentation, mold release, and much more. So sit back, grab some popcorn, and take notes as we take the mystery out of materials. BJB offers a wide variety of castable materials in a broad range of durometers. This gives you the option of casting the same part in different materials to see which one suits your application and part requirements. Flexible, semi-rigid, rigid, rigid clear, opaque, and many variations in between are all available from BJB. The work time of a material is the time in which a product is still considered pourable or workable in the intended application. In this case, we need to know how long we have to get the product mixed, degassed, and then poured into the mold. At a certain point, the material will begin to thicken and gel, making it non-flowing. Take note that stated work times on BJB data sheets are typically given in a 100 gram mass at room temperature. Because polyurethanes are exothermic and will react faster with increased mass, batches larger than 100 grams would have shorter work times than stated. So the size of your part and the mass of the batch required should be taken into account when choosing a material. Temperature of the material will also have an effect on the work time. Higher temps will shorten work time, and lower temps will slow reactions down. But don't go putting your material in a refrigerator or freezer just yet. We'll explain why in the next topic. The viscosity of a given material is something to consider when looking at materials for your part. If you have a very thin walled part and the viscosity of a system is rather high, then you might not want to choose something with a short working time. Viscosity is listed on BJB data sheets in centipoise. The lower the number, the thinner and easier a product flows. The higher the number, the thicker the product is. In this visual demonstration, you can clearly see the differences between material viscosities. In most cases, you should be choosing a material based on its physical properties, and understanding your selected material's viscosity will better prepare you in your mold design and material processing. So how does temperature affect viscosity? With castable polyurethane systems, viscosity lowers as temperature rises, but it also increases dramatically as temperatures go down. This characteristic is one reason why we don't recommend cooling materials to increase work time. Not to mention, you could cause crystallization in the liquid and may see decreased physical properties in the cured material. So it's important to monitor storage temperatures and the temperature of the liquid before you start mixing. The great thing about casting polyurethane systems is the option to add pigments and create parts with color straight out of the mold. But in some cases, the natural color of the polyurethane might make it difficult to achieve certain shades. For example, if a casting material has a strong white base color, it may be difficult to achieve dark reds, black, or certain color matches. If a product has an amber base color, it may be difficult to achieve bright white or other light colors. Clear or colorless systems offer the best color matching solution when it comes to pigment choices, but you may be limited on desired properties. So always consider the base color of the system before assuming you can achieve a desired shade. If you're gonna paint the part, then much of this doesn't apply other than using pigmentation as a base color. Before we cast into our new mold, we want to consider our options for mold release. Silicone molds are inherently self-releasing in conjunction with castable polyurethanes, but they will wear out faster without the use of an appropriate mold release. Think of it like repeatedly washing your hands. If you wash the natural oils away, your hands will dry out if you don't apply some sort of moisturizing lotion. So let's look at a couple of mold releases. If you plan to paint or bond to the part, 
you'll want to consider a paintable motor release, like our E302 rocket release. It washes off the surface of your part with warm water and mild detergent without leaving a stubborn residue. If your part does not require any post-processing like paint, our E236 urethane release works great. It contains silicone oils that offer maximum releasing properties while keeping the silicone mold from drying out prematurely. The downside is, is that silicone often transfers to the part and getting it clean enough for painting is very difficult, even with strong solvents. Another thing to consider is that mold releases can impart a texture on your cast part. So if you're trying to produce a perfectly shiny finish straight out of the mold and you don't want to polish, then you might opt to not use a mold release. But the trade-off will be that your mold will wear out much quicker. For our mold, we're going to spray the E236 urethane release. For best results, it's best to do light misting coats and not flood the surface, producing a wet dripping coat. That can cause an undesirable finish quality and may ruin the part. You'll also note that we're spraying the release outdoors and not in our casting area. Mold releases can possibly contaminate your working area, especially if you do any painting. Allow a few minutes for any propellants or solvents to evaporate before closing the mold halves. Clamping the mold together presents us with a few options. Many people use tape or rubber bands to secure the mold halves, and some will clamp between two rigid boards. If the silicone mold material is fairly flexible, tape or rubber bands may pinch and distort the mold to the point it can alter the interior geometry. I prefer the even pressure of clamped boards, so we've made a custom cap with holes for our fill port and vents. We want to set the proper mold angle to avoid trapping air bubbles. As mentioned in part one of this video series, we've located our fill port and air vents to create high and low points when angled correctly. We securely attach a small piece of wood under one corner, making a kickstand. With this kickstand secure, you don't have to worry about the base sliding off during the filling process. The boards can be taped or clamped tightly together to keep the mold halves closed. Now we can add our vent risers. As shown in our silicone mold making video, these plastic straws slide in with a perfect fit to form reservoirs, accounting for material shrinkage. Filling our mold with polyurethane can be as simple as a funnel and a piece of appropriately sized tubing to gravity fill. The extra height of the tubing will provide additional head pressure, using gravity to help push the material through the mold. If you're having problems filling the mold given the viscosity or work time of the casting material, then increasing the height will produce more head pressure, assisting to fill the mold faster. Another popular method to help fill molds with casting material is to use a rolled funnel like this one. Using materials like these transparency films for laser printers, you can make a really nice low-cost funnel that has a good reservoir of material and plenty of head pressure. Because the cone is tall and skinny, we'll have a smaller cross-section of mass combined with the increased head pressure to feed the mold. We've seen these made quite often out of heavier paper stock, but would advise against the use of paper because of the risk of moisture contamination. To make one of these funnels, simply roll the sheet from one corner across so that you form a tapered cone. It may take a couple attempts before you get the perfect funnel, but it's quick and easy. Tape near the bottom and top to keep it from unrolling. You can cut the narrow end with scissors until it fits snugly in your mold's fill port. For higher production casting, dispense equipment can be used to save labor and time by eliminating the need for weighing, hand mixing, and pouring. BJB offers its center point line of equipment from handheld, dual cartridge dispense guns, to advanced metering systems with heated storage tanks and precision pumps. You can visit the Centerpoint website to learn more about dispense equipment. We've chosen to cast our fire helmet with TC870FR. This product is a high impact, 70 Shore D product that is also fire resistant. That's right. BJB manufactures some products specially formulated with self-extinguishing properties. Don't assume a product is fire resistant unless it is otherwise specified. TC870 has a work time of 9 minutes and a mixed viscosity of 1000 centipoise. We're going to add 6821 cherry red pigment 
to give that signature red fire helmet look. TC870 has a mix ratio of 100 parts A to 52 parts B by weight, or 100 to 50 by volume. We estimate that we'll need 50 to 60 grams of material for this part, but we'll double that to ensure that we get a complete fill on the first pour. We'd rather end up with a little extra material than not enough, and we can adjust from there. For a total mix of 100 grams, we will need 65.8 grams of A and 34.2 grams of B. For a 2% loading of pigment, we will add 2 grams of cherry red. We pre-mix the cherry red pigment into the B side before adding the A side. You don't want to try and mix all three materials all at once. That's a recipe for failure. You can refer to our pigment data sheets for more detailed information on adding color to BJB casting products, and watch our videos on mixing two-part resin systems and calculating ratios if you need help with those topics. After you've mixed the pigment into the B, go ahead and add the A and B together. Thoroughly mix A and B together for 20 to 30 seconds, being sure to scrape the sides and bottom of the cup. Once mixed, transfer into a new clean cup and give a final stir, leaving any streaks of unmixed residue in the first cup. This technique is called double mixing, The mixture is then placed in our vacuum chamber to remove the air bubbles. If you don't pull a vacuum on the mixed product, you'll end up with bubbles in the material, which can cause ugly voids and lower the overall strength and quality of the cured part. So how much vacuum is required, you might ask? The level of vacuum required to quickly and effectively remove the trapped air is rather high. Using your shop vac in a coffee can is not going to work. You need a worthy pump capable of pulling upwards of 28 to 29 inches of mercury with a minimum flow rate of around 6 cubic feet per minute. You want to get your material in and out of the chamber as quickly as possible in order to maintain an adequate amount of work time getting the polyurethane into the mold. Time in the vacuum chamber varies on amount mixed, viscosity of the material, depth of the mixing container, and several other factors. On a mixture this small, it will only take a minute or two. Under such high vacuum, bubbles may never stop forming, so allow the liquid to degas beyond the major rise and fall of large bubbles and adjust as your work time allows. When the air valve is released, you'll see the remaining small bubbles dissipate. Carefully pour the degas material into your funnel so as not to induce any additional air. After a short time, you should see the material appearing in the vents. If you're experiencing a difficult time getting the material to flow through the mold within the work time, you can try increasing head pressure by using a taller funnel system or even pre-warming the tool in an oven. The heat lowers the viscosity and surface tension of the material as it enters the mold. The heat will also help jumpstart the curing process and promote quicker demolds. Another common step in the casting process is using a pressure tank after the mold has been filled with material. The pressure is used to compress any incidental bubbles formed as the material flows through the mold. It can also help force material into fine detail that would otherwise trap an air bubble. Contrary to popular belief, pressure does not force air bubbles out of the mold, replacing the need to vacuum degas. The pressure simply compresses air bubbles that may exist in the fluid to the point they're not visible anymore. Common pressure ranges used are between 40 and 80 psi. So pressure is not an essential step in casting, but it does eliminate some stubborn bubbles and provides another level of insurance in getting high quality parts out of the mold. One more thing to note would be that if you plan on pressure casting, you want to make sure the silicone used in making the mold was properly vacuum degassed. If not, your parts may come out looking like they have a case of the measles from the air trapped in the walls of the silicone mold. 
The demold time of TC870 is rated for 3 to 4 hours at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. This time may vary depending on a part's geometry, mass, or wall cross section. We remove the vent risers and funnel by twisting off at the sharp points. The tape is cut away to remove the silicone mold from the rigid boards. The mold is then slowly pried apart around the seams until one half can easily be removed. Since the helmet is still stuck in the thicker mold half, the edges are again flexed to loosen the mold's grip. Then it comes out without too much of a fight. The helmet looks great and we have the ability to make many more just like it. So, if you've been with us from our first video making a silicone mold through casting polyurethane parts, you're probably excited, maybe a bit scared, or your head is overflowing with tons of information. But if you break down the steps involved, understand that we've just given you the key information to being successful in making your own parts from silicone molds. We've shown you where mistakes happen and how to avoid them. We've also shown you best practices including using proper equipment and how that equipment affects the outcome of your parts. You can certainly choose what is practical for your situation and know that there is plenty of successful casting being done even with the minimum of equipment. Whether you have a handmade master to reproduce, an original piece that you can't get replacement parts for, or you have a 3D printer and need more durable parts with a faster turnaround, this process has been around for decades and is still a very practical and affordable way to get the job done. Now that you've seen the videos and we've helped take some of the mystery out of materials, you also found the source for high quality casting and mold making products. For questions regarding material selection and or process help, feel free to contact us by phone, through our website, or post in the comments below. Be sure to check out other helpful videos from BJB and thanks for watching.